Hey everybody, Pastor Brett here on this Friday evening and uh, a fun little change of plan here. You know, we uh, we mentioned last week that um, I was not going to do a prophecy update, um, but as it turns out, I'm not a prophet. Uh, I never claimed to be one. Uh, no, actually, uh, what I thought would be fun, there's so much going on in the world, and I think even when I mentioned this, I, was, I felt kind of like, man, there's so much I'd love to chat with all my prophecy update friends uh, with uh, with them on Friday night but I also kind of knew that the church were the, the this this week is going to be a big deal we've got seven Easter services and that's a lot of volunteers we have over uh, 2,000 volunteers uh, and we have lots of staff and you know, to make a prophecy update every kind of for us at Athey Creek it's kind of a big deal with all the people in the building um, so um after I made that announcement, I thought, boy, it'd be nice to do a little something. And then I thought, why not just uh, broadcast from my office? So here we are uh, in my office at the church, uh, all by my little loneliness here. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad to have you all with us tonight. I'm glad you found out uh, about this prophecy update. Uh, and so let's let's pray and then we'll get things started. And Lord, we are thankful uh, just to be able to communicate uh, even over technology, Lord, and to be able to sync up and Kind of fellowship around your word, Lord. We're so thankful uh, for your word that reminds us that you are the one who knows the beginning from the end. Uh, that, Lord, you are the one that tells us uh, what's going to happen in these days we're living, Lord. So I pray that you'd use this uh, time for your purpose, for your glory. I pray that uh, you'd bless all the folks that are tuning in even right now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, this is great. Uh, prophecy update of April, first Friday. We're going to sneak this one in uh, here from the office. By the way, uh, don't forget to click subscribe. Tell your buddies to subscribe and uh, get the word out. We love to talk about scripture. One of the things that I have found is a good benefit is I'm, I'm not necessarily just a prophecy update guy. Some people know me as that. Uh, but um, I'd say my, my main thing is through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Uh, that's my... That's what the Lord's really called me to. And so if you haven't tuned into our website, atheecreek.com, where you can, we have thousands and thousands of verse by verse, chapter by chapter, every study we've ever done from the beginning to the end of the Bible, we've done uh, a lot of teaching, thousands of teachings through the Bible. So if you're studying it in your own personal time, you know, uh, um, Exodus 44. Uh, you can just look that up on our website and see the various teachings. I probably did two or three teachings on Exodus chapter 44, and they're all available for your uh, free. Um, and uh, it, it, even some of the newer teachings in the last three or four years, uh, it's even some of the notes and the, the keynote uh, slides, they're all available there too. So it's it's a really cool resource. And our team does an outstanding job here providing that for people. So if you didn't know that about Athey Creek, that, that's our bread and butter. Uh, we just teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And we do the once a month prophecy update because it's just fun. And the Bible says to be watchmen and to be sober, to be vigilant. And we feel like, um, you know, it's the least we can do. There's a lot of really good Bible prophecy uh, guys and gals out there. Uh, you know, that are doing this on a more regular basis. And I would recommend, you know, Amir Tafati and uh, uh, Jan Merkel and Tom Hughes. There's there's a lot of really good people out there that do this uh, almost daily in some cases, which is really cool. Um, but I'm glad to have you with us. Uh, and uh, we get to talk about scripture. So anytime I get a chance to do that, let's go. So without further ado, um, so much is happening. Uh, you know, that's that's partially why I couldn't deny tonight. Um, and um, and again, let's let's start where we often do. I, I believe Israel um, is um, the epicenter of all things Bible prophecy. And sometimes I think we Americans lose sight of that a little bit. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, let me ask you a little rhetorical question. You can think about the answer. Which one's more important? Uh, um, the fact that President Trump was arrested this week and that maybe uh, you could argue that our legal system has been turned into a weapon against uh, political challengers, uh, is that a problem? Or which one's bigger? Netanyahu's got the same problem in Israel, um, uh, the weaponization of their legal system. And, and when he went to try to change uh, some of the rules about his judicial system, uh, basically Israel flipped out. Um, and so there's some sim similar uh, comparisons between Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. The difference is Netanyahu's back in power. Um, and what he did there 
uh, some are saying it's going to cause a civil war. So um, uh, whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But but here's my question: Which one's more important? And you might say, well, as an American, it's our president and and our judicial system. Uh, you could maybe make that argument as an American, but as a citizen of heaven, as a Bible prophecy student, um, uh, by far, I think everything that's happening in Israel is far more important. Um, I'm not going to ignore what's happening, I guess, with, you know, Donald Trump and our country and the dollar and, you know, um, uh, some of this, some of the stuff that's happening with our banks. Uh, I'm not going to ignore that, but um, all of that stuff about America and the United States, it tends to... Um, uh, just remind us that America's spiraling and we're, we're go- it seems that we're headed downward, which that does fit Bible prophecy because we're not in the picture. We're not mentioned. You'd think the biggest world power would be um, like a major, um, you know, player in biblical prophecy. But as it turns out, uh, we really are uh, non-existent. There, there's a few scriptures you could very loosely perhaps try to connect to the United States. But the, I think the main thing we need to take away is uh, we're not going to be a factor when it comes to Gog, Magog. Um, you know, we can maybe talk about how we might be one of those, um, you know, nations that are bystanders that are, uh, you know, sort of scolding uh, Russia, you know, and Gog and Magog is saying, you know, what do you, what do you think you're doing? Uh, and that sounds like what our country would do right now anyway. Um, so we, we fit the bill if that is speaking of the young lions, uh, but that's even a stretch, uh, honestly. Um, so we're really non-existent. So which one's more important as far as Bible prophecy? I think what's going on in Israel is more important. So we'll talk about some of that stuff. And what should we do? You know, let's remember, um, you know, right here in Psalm 122, verse 6, uh, we're reminded, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for they shall prosper that love thee. They being the nations, but also they being uh, personal uh, people praying for the peace. I think that's what we are, as Christians are supposed to do. Um, and when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, uh, we're praying really ultimately for the Prince of Peace, Jesus, to return. Uh, you know, the rapture of the church, the seven-year period called tribulation, the second coming of Christ, that's ultimately when peace will come to Jerusalem in the second coming of Jesus. Um, and those who love Jerusalem will prosper. That's a promise of the Bible. And it goes all the way back to Abraham. There, as many of you know, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where we read, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How would all all the families of the earth be blessed um, uh, through the Jews, through Abraham's line? Well, the answer is, don't forget, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was very Jewish. Uh, Again, we we Americans make Jesus the surfer from California, you know, the picture of Jesus uh, and stuff. But that's really not who Jesus was. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, he came not to do away with the law, but he fulfilled the law. He looked like a Jew. He acted like a Jew. And he fulfilled all Jewish laws, thereby um, making him the rightful Messiah, the King of Kings, died on the cross. And as we celebrate this weekend, he rose from the grave. Uh, that's why the earth All the nations of the earth are blessed because out of the Jews would come the Messiah to save Jews and Gentiles alike. Um, And that's the beauty of uh, the story. Uh, Christianity is not a cancellation of Judaism. Christianity is actually an extension, uh, uh, you know, the the fulfillment of Judaism. Uh, That's why um, we as Christians feel so linked, you know, to uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters in the sense that um, you know, Judaism started with the law, but Judaism, Judaism also foretold the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, who would save not just the Jews, but all the world uh, and uh, dying on the cross for our sins. So um, we got to remember, this is what we're called to do. All the nations of the world will be blessed through the Jews, even though the world largely hates the Jews and anti-Semitism is on the rise. We're seeing that all around the world. So um, so what do we see in Israel? Um, there's so much going on uh, today, uh, and, and even last night. If you're watching the news, I bet stuff's happening as I speak, uh, because things are, are heating up, um, both internally and externally. You should know, as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, well, right now, things aren't good. It, it kind of started every year uh, around Ramadan, this time of year, um, you know, we have these al Aska riots and uh, Temple Mount skirmishes and what have you. And 
we had kind of a big one the last few nights there in Jerusalem. And here's a video um, where we um, see the the, um, the Palestinians there on the Temple Mount, and they're they're uh, you know taking over um, the Al Aqsa Mosque, which is funny because they have access to that. But this you'll see it looks like warfare war zone. But those are fireworks that um, Palestinians are lighting off. It it almost the narrative you'll see even the the text on the bottom of this video is more pro Palestinian, saying you know the police broke down the doors and the windows, and they're you know they're doing all this. The police are this and police are that. What what was actually happening is a bunch of Palestinian young Palestinian men brought their backpacks uh, in with fireworks, knives, and rocks. And they were sleeping in Al-Aqsa. They were supposed to close it down, but they were spending the night there because they wanted to come and cause riots the next morning. Well, the Jews, the police said, we're not going to allow them to do that. So they went in and there was a bit of a skirmish. Um, this lady here yelling, you know, uh, that we saw here on this video, she, she's actually acting like there's a total bloodbath in there, you know, and, uh, but it wasn't, it was just a bunch of, um, Palestinians who were arrested, uh, different, different numbers, but the tensions are running high there at Alaska, the flashpoint of the Temple Mount site, you know, Islam's, uh, third most holy site, but the Palestinians really, it, you can, if you watch what they do up there, they they oftentimes... I don't think they really think it's a holy site. I think it's just a game they're playing. Um, Medina, uh, Mecca, those are holy sites of Islam. Um, it was al Aska that became the third most holy site in fairly recent history. It was Yasser Arafat's great uncle who declared al Aska the third most holy site in modern, fairly modern day. So kind of shocking, really, that the you can even see the, the Palestinians don't care. It's not a holy place. They're lighting off fireworks, throwing rocks, stuff like that. Um, but, uh, because of that, uh, you know, the Israelis, uh, you know, went into the Alaska Mosque. So then suddenly there was, uh, rockets being fired from Hamas, uh, both, and this is interesting, both from the South and from the North Hamas up in the North is not something you hear a lot about. Normally in the North in Lebanon, we're talking about Hezbollah, but Hamas is up there firing rockets along with Hezbollah. Um, and, um, you know, basically, um, uh, this is the retaliation of the Jews invading, as they called it, Al-Aqsa. It wasn't really an invasion. It was the Jews just providing security, trying to keep peace. The Jews have no interest in taking over, at least, you know, um, governmentally or anybody for that matter, you know, hostily taking over the Temple Mount. But that's the narrative of the Muslims, that the Jews are wanting to take over the third most holy site of all of Islam, and that's why they were, you know, invading al Aqsa. So they're, they're, they're using it as an optical, uh, you know, issue to turn up the heat. Um, so in truth, the Palestinians were just waiting there to cause more riots, and the Jews were just, uh, res, you know, trying to bring in security to the Jerusalem. Um, you know, there's the, um, you know, the rockets then that came from Lebanon, there's all kinds of images that you can see out there. They're kind of interesting. Um, the, the Iron Dome at work, um, a fresh round of rocket sirens, sirens were sounding across all of southern Israel, uh, the cities and towns after uh, uh, incoming rocket alerts in a bunch of the towns down there. Um, the military um, didn't give a lot of details on this, but there are reports of some houses that were hit in Israel and um, people, there's some kind of footage. I think we forget sometimes what it's like, what it must be like to live there and uh, actually have rockets, you know, hitting in your neighborhood. And that uh, Iron Dome didn't stop apparently all the rockets last night. We need to be praying for Jerusalem, praying for Tel Aviv. Um, but about 40 rockets, the last I counted, uh, were launched from Gaza Strip uh, and southern Israel amid Israeli airstrikes. Um, but some of the pictures we have, you know, here of Israeli police removing the remains of an uh, intercepted rocket that was fired from Lebanon uh, into northern Israel uh, on uh, yesterday, April 6th. Um, and the Israeli air defenses intercepted the rocket, so the rocket fell down and stuck into the asphalt of this little Israeli town. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, is uh, bolstering their southern command and the northern command with additional infantry, the, uh, artillery forces. Um, the military spokesman, Daniel uh, Hagari, said uh, they're, they're beefing everything up on their borders. So if you lived in Israel right now, you'd be feeling kind of this escalation. Um, and um, 
there's people that have uh, literally had to take cover uh, because of what's happening. So then Israel responds, of course, like in my opinion, they have a right to defend them. If, if, if the United States had rockets flying from, say, Canada into Montana and Oregon, um, would we just say, uh, you know, oh, we got to be patient and see the, the UN ridiculously, as they always do, the UN says, um, Israel, you know, you need to show restraint here. Um, it just is amazing to me that anybody could, with a straight face, say Israel needs to show restraint when rockets are flying across their borders. I feel like Israel has every right to defend themselves from rockets flying across their border. Um, Daniel Hagari, the military spokesman, in a Twitter post uh, said the decision to bolster forces was made following the, um, you know, the assessment to strengthen their defenses. Uh, the forces are at high level of readiness right now. Uh, some are saying, could this be the next Intifada war? Um, but um, but these uh, these strikes uh, from Israel to Lebanon uh, also they shoot down into the Gaza Strip. So there's the, you know the world tends to condemn Israel quickly, um, uh, which is part of the the I believe it's part of the worldview. And, you know when you look at something like that and you think that doesn't make sense. Uh, Israel has a right to defend herself as a nation. We would at least we should think that about any nation that's being fired upon with rockets. Should they just take the beating and do nothing? Well, that's what the world pretty much tells Israel uh, to show restraint and all this stuff. Um, but I think this is part of the narrative that will lead up to all the nations, especially the, the local nations around Israel, to hate Israel. They're building their case against Israel. And I believe that is part of the fulfillment that's going to lead us to the Gog Magog invasion. There's going to be a rationalization of why Israel should be attacked and ultimately leading to Armageddon where the Antichrist and his forces uh, the, during the tribulation period will attack Israel and the Jews and these nations. The second coming of Christ is going to include Christ coming to subdue and judge those nations that attack Israel. I feel like this, this is the stage being set for uh, the biblical narrative. Uh, it wouldn't take much. Uh, could it be today? Could be. Could it be 100 years from now? Possibly. We don't know. Um, well, then why are we even talking about it? Because the Lord tells us to watch, be sober, be vigilant, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're supposed to care about this. And, uh, and I think there's this beautiful thing that happens to us as Christians when we are watching and praying about this. It keeps us on the track, the right track. I think that's the way the Lord wants us to live. Even if the Lord doesn't return in our lifetime, um, I think the Lord wants us living with our nose in the book, in the scripture, and looking to what uh, the scriptures say about these last days. Why would the Bible take such detail to explain what the last days would look like if we weren't supposed to read about that? Um, you, you, you know, you guys that are here, probably I'm preaching to the choir because uh, you guys get it. You understand why Bible prophecy is important. But it's sad to me how much of the church of Jesus Christ actually doesn't care. Uh, oh, you know, we just don't care. You know, whatever happens is going to happen. And, you know, even some of the narratives are trying to say things are getting better right now. Uh, you know, if you're a, you know, post-millennialist, uh, you kind of have this view that, oh, we're going to usher in the kingdom. <laughs> it's such a, a depressing view. I, I, I would be really depressed if that were my view. My view, uh, pre-millennial, pre-trib rapture, um, it's only going to get better from here. You know, we're, we're going to see the worse. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to see it get dark. The Bible says perilous times will come in the last days, uh, Paul told Timothy. And so um, when we see the doom and gloom that's happening around us, that's the world causing that. But we look forward to, of course, boom and zoom, where the rapture of the church happens, the trumpet sounds, we get to be with the Lord. And then after the tribulation period, seven years, then the second coming of Christ which is where he's going to fix everything. Uh, it's going to be glorious. So we have some stuff that we really look forward to. But um, a lot of good pictures here that we have of the uh, rockets. It's kind of interesting. And when I look at these pictures, uh, I, I recognize streets that um, I've driven on uh, when, when I've rented cars in some of those northern and southern towns. Um, and it's heartbreaking because it, it sort of, I, it, it brings it a little more closer to home when I, I've driven on these streets where they're picking rockets out of the asphalt. Uh, it makes me want to just pray that much more for people that live in Israel. Um, but um, if that's not, you know, tough enough for Israel, 
um, that's actually perhaps not the worst thing. These, these things happen all the time. Um, you know, we see rockets fly. Last time we were in Israel, uh, something like 2,000 rockets flew across the borders while we were there. Um, uh, that was our last trip to Israel. Of course, you know, we as tour groups, we don't really go to those areas where the rockets are landing. Um, but, uh, but we, you know, we, uh, that's not new. But what is sort of new is um, what's happened internally in Israel. And you should be aware, maybe you've seen on the news, uh, a turmoil inside of Israel. And, and it comes from this Israeli judicial overhaul that Benjamin Netanyahu uh, was wanting to, uh, you know, wanting to engage in. Uh, here's a picture, uh, a, a aerial view showing people protesting in uh, Tel Aviv against the Israeli government. Um, the judicial overhaul bill, and this was back uh, a few weeks ago on March 25th. So um, Israel finds itself in a weakened sort of state because the, the nation is really divided. Um, if it, it, It's bad enough to where there were actual IDF soldiers not reporting to duty saying, if this is where our government's going, we're not going to fight. Um, we're not going to stand as soldiers. Like, um, you know, up until now, uh, from the beginning of Israel, uh, the, the, the military has stood uh, united, uh, which makes, makes them powerful. The Israeli army, the IDF is powerful, and they've demonstrated that. Uh, their unity has been second to none. Because of all the enemies they have, I think it's kept them unified. But this is the first time that I can remember seeing such a division in Israel internally, um, more than 100,000 protesters showed up here on this work, this picture that I was showing you um, where um, these protests got heated. And uh, there's talk even of civil war. If you read some of the comments, um, military members saying that if Netanyahu gets away, gets his way, they're not going to they're not going to sh show up. They're not going to report for duty. Um and so that's that's a very real problem that Netanyahu. You know, now at last I checked, he's kind of backed off. He's trying to, you know, um, figure this out because uh, the internal turmoil is tearing the, the nation apart. Um, but the the big question is: Is Netanyahu? Is this a big power grab? That's what all these protesters are saying that Netanyahu is going to become too powerful. Um, others would say no. Netanyahu is trying to take away the judicial system's weaponization of their legal process. Um, you know, Netanyahu is in all kinds of legal trouble, if you know. Um, and it's questionable, you know, did he take gifts? Uh, somebody from, you know, Botswana gave him a gift. And if he kept the gift, uh, the football or the trophy or the cup or whatever, uh, that he was supposed to turn that over to the Israeli uh, government. And maybe he didn't. Like the, the, the charges that they're sort of trying to, you know, trump up on him, pardon the word, um, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're, they're weak arguments. That's why he got elected and was able to uh, form a government because most people know that was just the politicization of um, the judicial system in Israel. It's, it's a similar problem that we might be facing here in, in America. And, you know, if that's happening, then our democracies, Israel and the United States, our democracies are at risk. And um, that's where, you know, the only d true democracy, democracy in all the Middle East, Israel, um, is at risk right now. So, um, so in addition to, you know, the problems they're dealing with, uh, with the riots and the, that whole thing with Netanyahu, at the same time, the United States and Israel, uh, we, we're reaching a new low uh, in our relationship, which is sad. It's sad for so many reasons. If we want to see America fall, then the, the, the fastest way to do that is to be against Israel. Remember, I will bless the nations that bless Israel and I will curse the nations that curse Israel. And, um, you know, we you could almost make a pretty legitimate argument that the United States seems pretty cursed lately. Um, whether it's our economy or inflation or tornadoes that are happening all over right now. And man, have you seen some of these towns? I'm not saying that God is judging the people of, you know, Missouri or whatever, but it does seem like these cataclysmic events often do match what the United States, um, you know, our attitude toward Israel. And the, and, uh, the Biden administration has taken a whole new level. This is a Israel Today article, um, a new phase in U.S.-Israel relations. Um, the article says, Israel was rocked by the news on Thursday 
that the United States Department had to order NASA scientist Dr. Amber uh, Strawn to cancel her participation in Israel's uh, Physical Society's annual meeting. Uh, the news came following Strawn's posting on Twitter that her travel organization was revoked, uh, authorization was revoked on Wednesday. Um, the State Department's move, which gives the appearance of an uh, official boycott, would be stunning under any other circumstance. Um, but it's all the more alarming coming at the heels of President Joe Biden's shocking remarks in relation to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government efforts to place minimal limits on Supreme Court's currently limitless power. Um, that, that's what he's trying to do. So what did Joe Biden say? Uh, well, his shocking remarks uh, were apparently off the cuff uh, to reporters on this last Tuesday. Uh, Biden uh, said curtly, uh, I, uh, like many strong supporters of Israel, I am very concerned and I'm concerned that they get this judicial reform straight. Uh, they cannot continue down this road. Uh, hopefully the prime minister will act in a way that he's going to try to work out some genuine compromise, but that remains to be seen. Well, then after uh, in, in, in interfering with Israel's domestic affairs, which the American president's really not, the Jews really don't like when our presidents do that, uh, Biden added, we're not interfering. Uh, they know my position. They know America's position. They know the American Jewish position. Then in a follow-up question, a reporter asked Biden if he would invite Netanyahu to the White House, and the president's response was an immediate uh, and unhesitating said, no, not in the near term, which is a, a pretty shocking and sort of uh, making a point that we don't really like him, and he's not invited. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty big deal that our president said that. Um, and so when I hear our president sort of... Uh, disrespecting the president of Israel. It makes me concerned for our nation because that never works out good for any nation that crosses Israel or, or is down on Israel. I'm not, again, I'm not arguing that Israel's perfect, that their government's perfect. They're largely a nation of unbelievers, um, but they're still God's chosen people. And God has a plan for them. And uh, the Lord tells us in his word that they're going to be saved in the, in the last days. But in the meantime, we're still we're still supposed to be supporters of Israel, not supporter of everything they do, but but United States is all but condemning Israel. We're becoming like all the other nations, uh, honestly. Um, now, with Israel, that's not the only thing that's going on. With uh, the United States, our temperature is getting chillier and chillier against the Israelis. Um, Israel did make an interesting new deal uh, with Finland that you should know about. Um, and uh, there's some interesting uh, pics and video you can see online, you know, or check out where um, what's going on with Finland. Well, Finland um, just recently was admitted or joined the NATO military alliance. That's a kind of a big deal. Um, Finland said Wednesday that it will purchase Israel's uh, weapons tech. Uh, remember when we talked about David's sling? Uh, I think I showed you their missile defense system uh, in previous prophecy updates. Um, you know, here's some footage uh, of the David sling, uh, you know, video. It's, it's an amazing technology. It's a little bit like the iron dome, but, um, it's even bigger and more high tech, but the, uh, Finland, uh, paid something like $344 million, uh, to have a little bit of this tech from Israel that doesn't allow missiles. Now, why is fin Finland getting this? It's really because they're close to Russia and Russia's attack Ukraine and the NATO nations, um, David's sling system will extend the operational range of Finland's, you know, ground-based air defense capabilities, um, and it'll help significantly. Apparently, um, the uh, Finnish defense minister uh, uh, Anidi uh, Kaikunen said this acquisition will create a new capability for the Finnish defense forces to intercept targets at high altitude. At the same time, we are continuing the ambitious and long-term development of Finland's defense capability and a new security environment. So you say, okay, Brett, so what? So Israel sold some missile defense stuff to Finland. The thing you have to remember about this, this, you know, how does Vladimir Putin view this? You say, well, who cares? Well, this is where it comes to Bible prophecy. You see, um, in Bible prophecy, Putin uh, you know, we wonder, is he the one who will eventually, maybe it's not him, but if he is, could he be Gog of Magog? 
You know, he's showing aggressive behaviors and it wouldn't take much if you ask me for him to be the one that the Bible talks about. Ezekiel 38, um, the, you know, the, the hook in the jaw of the bear coming from the north to attack Israel. Um, Israel and Russia have already had a little bit of a tense uh, time, especially since the Ukraine war, because um, because Israel hasn't like completely sided with Russia, but they haven't completely sided with the Ukrainians. But slowly the Israelis are helping more and more with Ukrainians uh, and then also now helping the Finnish, uh, you know. Uh, the, so the big question about this deal that Israel makes with Finland um, what will what will make Russia come down to take a spoil? This Israel's Israel's on Russia's bad list for several reasons. If they're providing the finish with this defense, it it weakens Russia's ability to attack or maybe even defend uh, itself, which Putin's not going to like that. But also Israel is providing Europe. They're one of the few providers of gas and other things uh, resources that. Um, Largely, Russia has choked out, and and so Israel supplying what maybe be you know NATO nations, uh, the Russians don't like what Israel is doing, and Israel is doing it in a big way. So, um, so that makes you kind of wonder about this whole thing about the Ezekiel thirty eight and Israel and Russia. It's definitely something to keep your eye on. What is Putin gonna do concerning Israel and you know giving this defense system to Finland? Also, uh, you know, in the Gog Magog discussion, you, you can't uh, leave out Iran. Um, you know, Iranians are doing all kinds of little stuff. You know, this the, these rockets coming from uh, Hezbollah and Hamas that I talked about earlier, they're they're really coming from Iran. They're they're just proxies of Iran. The Hezbollah and the Hamas they're funded, weaponized by the Iranians, um, and the Iranian proxies continue to arm themselves with better weapons. Um, now, um, a lot of that happens up there in Syria as well. Uh, the United States, we, we've only shown weakness in Syria. We've been attacked many, many times in Syria, and the United States has done a few little tiny, um, you, you couldn't even really call them retaliations. Uh, our current administration has proven uh, weakness, and we're not, we're not really showing a strong posture, especially in Syria. So... Uh, in, in a lot of the world's eyes, the United States is becoming even more of a joke after our disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. There was a report that came out this last week showing how it's worse than we even imagined. The uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan is worse than we even knew. Um, so the Iranians are becoming emboldened and, um, and they're feeling like the Israelis and the United States, we are weakening, which is exactly what the Iranians have been waiting for. Uh, and I would say the uh, Muslim fundamentalists uh, uh, have a very long patience. Uh, that's their long game. They want to see the weakening of the United States, the weakening of Israel. Um, this uh, Times of Israel article, Iran's supreme, supreme leader, is Israel's demise is coming faster than I expected. He, the, you know, the Ayatollah seems to be delighted. Uh, oh, I can't believe Israel's failing. And they might even have a civil war. Um, Iran, I'll, I'll read part of this article. It says, Iran's supreme leader Ali Khamenei told local leaders on Tuesday that the Zionist regime, as he likes to call it, was disappearing faster than he had anticipated and internal Israeli divisions over the government's controversial judicial overall. That's what we were talking about earlier. Um, their own officials continuously warn that their collapse is nearing. Their president, uh, President um, Ayatollah says, their former prime minister uh, says this, their military chief says this, that their defense minister says uh, all of this, uh, that, you know, that they're going down. Uh, Khomeini said, appearing to refer to concerns voiced by public fig figures, uh, like uh, President Isaac Herzog, if you remember him, uh, that civil conflict could break out uh, over disagreements. And so they're delighted. They're, they're happy. Um, <clears throat> they say their uh, collapse is nearing and that they won't make it to their uh, 80th birthday. That's, the, that's what Iran would love uh, for Israel to not make it to their 80th birthday. Uh, uh, I told, I told it goes on and says, we said a few years ago, back in 2015, that they, they would, uh, wouldn't reach the next 20 or 25 year point, point uh, from then. But they themselves are in a rush and they wanna leave the idea of the, the map sooner. Um, so this is interesting to watch 
um, you know, the, the Ayatollah and the Iranians, uh, they, they smell blood in the water. Uh, and they're swarming around Israel with Hezbollah, Hamas. Um, there, it wouldn't take much, you know, there's already been enough talk about Iran and Israel going to war over their nuclear program. But Israel is not really in a great place to do, go to war with anybody. They're at war with themselves internally right now, which the Iranians are seeing as possibly an opening, which some for us to pray about. Uh, we can see uh, how the uh, Ezekiel 38 possibility could happen. Along with Isaiah 17, the attack of Damascus, you Bible prophecy folks know, that's part of that. Maybe it could be connected to the Gog Magog invasion. Now, let's see, there's all kinds of topics. I feel like I'm shot getting here, but this is just a off the cuff tonight. Uh, I'm just kind of winging it a little bit here, but I, I, there's so many things. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention tonight is, uh, did you hear the uh, criminalization of physical cash in Europe? Um, uh, a natural news article, European Parliament to criminalize physical cash use by imposing limit on cash transactions. Um, a member of the European Parliament um, has warned that the European Union is in danger of criminalizing the use of physical cash in favor of using digital currencies with its new anti-money laundering laws. You know, under those auspices, they, criminal activity, uh, money laundering, um, they, they are wanting to eliminate that by digitalizing currency. Currency. Um, um, now, again, I don't really even need to speak to you uh, prophecy buffs. You know, in Revelation 13, the second beast forces everyone in the world to receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand. Um, and it says uh, there in Revelation 13, 17, you know, it says they, could, they will not be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark, which would be the name of the beast or the number of his name, uh, which you guys know as 666. That, that, that's going to be a cashless society that'll happen during the tribulation period. You see, this technology or this idea doesn't even have to happen before the rapture. Uh, the rapture could happen, then this cashless society could be implemented. So we're not really even looking for that, but it is interesting that the world is moving that direction. And uh, Europe is starting to say, we're gonna start criminalizing cash. Maybe if you live here in the United States, you've seen where there are some people in places that don't accept cash anymore. And it's, uh, to a lot of us guys my age or older, we're kind of shocked. Like, what? You don't take the American dollar? Uh, and they'll just kind of laugh at you and say, well, where's your credit card or, you know, uh, whatever. Um, speaking of that, um, uh, that brings me kind of to the next thing that should be noted. Um, and again, what happens in America is definitely less than what, what we're seeing, you know, what we need to be watching in Israel. But it does play into it, as America is still somewhat of a superpower, but the days of that could be numbered. Um, speaking of the American dollar, there's been speculation lately that the U.S. dollar is on the verge of a major decline and might even lose its status as the world's major major uh, reserve currency. Um, most of us sit around and say, yeah, whatever, that doesn't matter to me. But it actually does, and it will. Um you know, um, it's, I'm not great at explaining all this stuff, but, um, you know, like one, one way to look at it is like we've been using the American dollar for our currency for our gas prices. And so the United States has traditionally had the lowest gas prices in the world. I remember um, years and years ago, I went to Burkina Faso and went to a gas station and filled a moped, <laughs> little, you know, two gallon tank. I don't even know if it had two gallons. Um, but I remember seeing it at that time, this was like 20 or 30 years ago, it was $8 a gallon. And I remember thinking, man, how do these guys afford to drive? And then I realized, oh, nobody's driving. <laughs> they all had mopeds and, and most of them were pedaling. Uh, because $8 a gallon there in Burkina Faso, people couldn't really afford that, you know. Um, why is that? It has to do with the exchange rate. Um, we pay uh, with American petrodollars. And we, are, we don't have to pay exchange rates and taxes on exchange and what have you. Um, because the, you know, the United States is the world's major reserve currency, which that in and of itself gives the American dollar uh, a, a higher value and a trusted value. But um, there's two things that are going on right now. First of all, the de-dollarization or movement away from using the U.S. dollar 
because there's so many other countries that are sick of us as the United States getting away with uh, having that luxury of you know the United States dollar being the world's major reserve currency. Um, there's a group of nations that would love to see a different uh, group, uh, a different dollar amount or, or delineation. Um, have you heard of BRICS? If you look it up on Wikipedia, it'll explain for you. BRICS is an acronym for five leading emerging, emerging economies in the world. Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That's B-R-I-C-S, BRICS. Uh, and they're the, you know, here's a picture of them all, you know, hand in hand, because their goal um, is to group together, um, and they've been doing this for a long time, by the way, the, the, the first four, the BRIC, without the S, were initially grouped as BRIC in 2001 by Goldman Sachs economist Jim O'Neill, who coined the term to describe this, this you know, fast-growing uh, uh, economies of these nations that would, have, would eventually, as he predicted, dominate the global economy by 2050. Um, but some are saying, wait a minute, that seems to be closer than we even thought. 2050 seems like a long way away um, to us, but it, it, that might have been a, um, a bad guess. It, it could be 2024 or 2023. Um, and the reason why that might be happening faster, where the dollar loses its status and, you know, the community of these nations, BRICS, uh, China, Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, the reason they, they might even have a possibility of being successful is because the American dollar is weakening for other reasons. For example, the printing of dollars. We print like crazy. And the more you print dollars, um, the, the weaker the dollar becomes, as you guys know, uh, if you had any uh, any f basic uh, economics training, um, but also the weakening of the dollar, um, and I'm not going to go into all this tonight from my office here, but um, but basically one of the things that's happening is the way we put um, you know restrictions on Russia because the Ukrainian Russian war um, by trying to restrict Russia with our dollar. Um, some are arguing that we're the only ones who are the, the true victims of that. Our dollar is weakening, and meanwhile, uh, Russia's economy is getting stronger. Um, so it's interesting. Some are suggesting that the way our current administration has handled the Russia and putting printing money is going to speed up this process to weaken the dollar, and no longer will we have that as the world global currency. And that's going to make everything for us a lot more expensive. If it's, if it's not expensive enough now, we're, I think we're only seeing the beginning of that, um, which could contribute to that weakening of America in general. You know, I talked about that, um, that we're out of the picture largely um, when it comes to, uh, you know, the end times. We don't see the United States uh, there. So um, America is weakening economically. We're weakening uh, in our leadership. We're weakening in our, um, you know, uh, global uh, interaction with nations. I mean, we're becoming a joke uh, because of our uh, weak backbone as this administration will not do what it needs to do in Syria and Afghanistan, the way we pulled out. Um, there's so many reasons why we're going down a, a path that's not good. But um, probably the worst thing that we're seeing is morally uh, the United States. I, I think if there's one thing that's going to implode this nation more than anything, is just our, uh, we are just, uh, light speed diving into these transgenders. I saw in the Supreme Court today, I know it was a temporary sort of order, but basically they, they ordered that men can compete against women, uh, this whole transgender and sports thing. Um, now, it was a temporary ruling from what I understand, and, and the Supreme Court admitted, we're going to have to cover this topic later. But their ruling today didn't didn't give me very much promise uh, to feel like, oh, they're going to make the right decision when they have to really come down. To me, it's so ridiculous, um, this whole uh, men and women competing each other. Did you see that story um, from Not the Bee where that coach uh, just made a kind of a protest of his – he was a strong coach, you know, and he, he said, I'm a woman. And he st and then he went into this women's bench press competition and he and he beat the – he beat the uh, – the top world record holder um, who was actually a transgender man who had beat all the women in that class and broke the women's world record, but he was actually a man. So like what a dichotomy and what a weird 
country we're living in where we don't know the difference between a man or a woman. This is all part of the lack of morality. The transgender issue that we're seeing is one of the most demonic and uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's denying that God exists. You know, that, that uh, we're just created, you know, we're not, we weren't created, we just are whoever we want to be. Basically, I'm the God and I can decide if I'm male or female. God can't decide that. It's, it really gets down to just basically rebellion against God. That's why if you're a Christian and you're temp tempted to use people's pronouns the way they want and uh, to acknowledge this as something that's wonderful, first of all, it's bad. Um, you know, you know, I don't think it's loving because transgender people truly are, are the most suicidal of any group that we've ever seen in the history of the world. 40% suicide rate among transgenders. We need to give them real help and that would be to be repentant, to submit to God, to receive the love of God, and not to fly in his face and say, yeah, well, I'm not a man or I'm not a woman. That's only gonna, That rebellion is only going to hurt them. And when Christians think they're doing the right thing by being loving and saying, oh, yes, I'll, I'll use your pronouns and I'll accept this, you're actually jumping on board with the demonic um, movement that's, that's bringing this country down morally. Um, and we're hurting people in the process. I hope that um, that you haven't bought into that love is love thing. Uh, horrible, horrible. No, God is love. That's the truth, the truth of the matter. Uh, transgenderism is everything opposite of Christianity and of what God calls people to be. Uh, you know, transgenderism says stand up for yourself. The Bible says deny yourself. Um, you know, like it's, it's amazing. We just go down the list and see how point for point transgenderism is just hurting the person that calls themselves transgender. So um, by seeing the United States going down that and, and then all the other corruption and lawlessness and stuff that we're seeing, you might say, well, this is depressing. Um, but remember, this is all part of the signs of the times. Um, when you see these things, Luke 21, you know, uh, 28, when you see these things come to pass or begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads for uh, your redemption draweth nigh. Uh, we, we're looking uh, not for Antichrist or for, you know, the destruction of the United States. We are looking for Jesus and keeping our eyes on him. And even when things get bad, we keep our eyes on Jesus. Um, one last thing, I could go on and on. I, because I'm in my little office here, I feel like I'm rambling. Maybe I am. <laughs> but um, but I, uh, I do want to say this. Um, I've noticed there's a tendency for Christians to say, let's get out of here or bail out of our town. And, you know, as a, you know, if some of you guys that live in some of those nice places where uh, you guys don't have the same issues that we do here in Portland, Portland's kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to craziness. Um, you know, our town, we've lost our minds. And, uh, you know, a lot of businesses are gone now out of Portland's like a ghost town in a lot of ways. And um, just the homeless, fentanyl use and meth and, and uh, all the stuff. It's, it's so tragic. But um, a lot of people say, man, let's get out of here. We're going to get out of Oregon because uh, we have an extremely godless, very progressive, liberal sort of agenda here in Oregon. And uh, and I understand why people say, we're out of here. We're going to move. Um, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. Um, you know, and I especially understand, um, you know, if you're trying to find a place to raise your children. Um, I get it. I get why some of you guys have left Oregon. Uh, we love y'all who are out there who moved. But I just want to plant this seed uh, before we sign off tonight. And that is, um, I wonder if the Lord not, might not just raise up people who are willing to run into the fire um, to save souls. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Debbie and I, you know, 20, almost 28 years ago now, um, we left Southern Oregon, which is basically Mayberry, USA, where, where we grew up in, you know, Applegate, Oregon. It's just a small little town, uh, country, sweet had a lot of friends, uh, you know, a lot of farmers, a lot of hicks, which I love. Uh, we were installed down there, you know, just good stuff. Um, but Deb and I moved to Portland, and some people thought we were crazy. <laughs> um, and we at times thought, are we crazy uh, moving to Portland? But there was actually, it was an intentional move because we moved up here to start Athey Creek because it was on the list of the top, it was the most unchurched city in America. And, um, and Seattle took a second back there in 1996 when we moved. Um, 
and Seattle and Portland and jockey back and forth. Which is the most godless city in America? Well, Portland has proven, and we've become a joke. I mean, we're a byword. If you listen to all the news agencies, they talk, oh, Portland, Oregon, you know. Um, but that's why Debbie and I moved here. Um, and even with our children, uh, knowing that the schools were messed up. Now, I, I have to admit, I didn't know that the schools were going to get as crazy as they are. I have to say, I'm glad my kids are grown adults uh, now because uh, putting your kids in public school today, I don't think I could do that as a public school teacher myself. Like I, I have my degree in education. That I have a heart for public edu education. And, and um, Athey Creek, we support teachers who are out there in the public schools who are trying to stand up. Uh, my daughter's one of them. She's a wonderful teacher, an outstanding teacher who um, is uh, really works harder than anybody I know uh, to be a good teacher and teach kids what they need to know. Meanwhile, she deals with stuff like uh, tampon machines in the fifth grade boys' bathroom. Uh, that like That's something that I'd say, I'm moving to Idaho <laughs> or I'm moving to Arizona or Texas or Florida. Um, you know, I'm getting out of here because they, they, how crazy do you have to be? And the whole state of Oregon did that. They didn't even let the principals and teachers know. I mean, they knew it was kind of coming, but suddenly there's these boxes in the boys' restroom. The little boys ran into the, te the teacher's room saying, you know, what's going on? What are they? You know, and, and the teachers had to explain, how do you explain such insanity? Um, and so I, I understand why people have bailed and said, we're getting out of here. But I would, I would challenge some of you to pray and say, Lord, would you want me to be one who runs into the fire to save lives, to save souls? Because I want to say, don't forget, what, what's our, one of our highest callings? You know, I love the Great Commission. We, we just studied that in Matthew 28. Um, also in Mark's gospel, like here in Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 15, where, you know, he said unto them, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, that's what we're called to do. Um, let me finish with a little bedtime story for you uh, as I'm waxing uh, long here uh, on this prophecy update. Um, there's a great story that I love, and this is kind of what I picture we need to do as Christians. Um, uh, there's a story that uh, on a dangerous seacoast where ships were uh, wrecked. It happened all the time. There was uh, Once there was this little crude, little life-saving saving station. The building was no more than a hut. Um, there was only one boat and only a few devoted members uh, that kept constant watch over the sea with no thought for themselves. These, these guys would go out day or night um, and, um, and tirelessly search for lost people from shipwrecks. Um, and some of those who were saved um, uh, and various others in the surrounding area wanted to be associated with this little hut and this life-saving station. So they would donate their time and their money and started to improve the life-saving station and effort, support the work. They even bought new boats and, and a new, new crews that were trained and the life-saving station grew. It got remodeled and then built up a little bit. But some of the new members of this life-saving station, they were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. And they felt uh, that a more comfortable place should be uh, provided as, as the first refuge of those who would be saved uh, from the death uh, the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture uh, in the enlarged brand new building. Uh, now the life saving station became a popular gathering place. It was comfortable, and it had its members. It was almost like uh, you know you'd, a club. They decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because um, they used it as sort of a place to hang out. You know, um, uh, fewer members were not even interested in going to the sea on life saving missions, um, so they hired a lifeboat crew to do this work. They hired somebody else. And the life-saving motif still prevailed. In fact, the original little dinghy boat that they used to originally, they hung that on the wall as a decoration. Um, and uh, it was like a memorial in the room of how they started humbly in their little club. But a memorial lifeboat in the room there uh, where the clubs would hold their initiation meetings. And about this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast one evening. And the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick and smelly. Some of them were foreigners. And the beautiful new club was in chaos. Immediately, the, poor, proper, uh, the property committee hired someone to rig up a shower house outside of the club where the victims of the shipwrecks 
could be cleaned up before coming inside and messing up their club. Um, at the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities altogether because it was an unpleasant nuisance to the normal social life <laughs> of the club. But a small number of the members that were the original few insisted that life-saving was their primary permit purpose. That's why they were there, and they pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But the small group's members were voted out and told if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. Um, as the years went by, however, the new life-saving station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station would be founded. And history continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters still, but most of the passengers drown. <laughs> the end. Uh, there it is. I, I think that's a great story. Um, you know, as disciples of Jesus, our primary task um, is to go into the fire, or the world, to go into the dark world and make disciples, teaching, being lights, being salt. Um, and to put it another way, we're to go save lives, save souls. Um, and I think, unfortunately, sometimes we as Christians, we're so into our comfortable thing and we got our church and we can come and hang out in church and, and it's our club and we have good fellowship and good food and, and comfortable. Meanwhile, we forget that there's um, people dying. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, instead of maybe looking like, how can I get out of here or, or insulate or isolate away from all this worldliness and craziness, I wonder if we need to pray and say, Lord, am I called to run into the fire, not run from the fire, um, and let your light so shine and save souls and preach the gospel. Um, I wonder if that's what the Lord's calling us to do. He calls us to be doers of the word, not just here. See James, you know, one twenty-two. <laughs> uh, there, verse one, chapter chapter one, verse twenty-two, uh, where we're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So. Um, that's maybe something in this prophecy that I'd like to say is as the world gets darker and gloomier mm -hmm. and the United States gets more and more immoral and we see transgenderism on the rise and people with weird ideals and ideology, um, it, there's a temptation to run and to isolate and to try to be as comfortable as we possibly can. But I wonder if we need to get a little dirty and go out and preach the gospel and talk to people that nobody else wants to talk to. Maybe this Resurrection Sunday, wherever you are around the world, maybe the Lord wants you to invite someone to church this Sunday. If there was ever a Sunday where somebody might step foot in a church because they maybe feel like they might need to or should, it's Resurrection Sunday. This is a great chance for you to do that. So there it is. Uh, we could go on and on, but I wanted to get you up to speed on some of the things that I'm watching. There's a lot more going on, but those are some of the highlights I think that are important. Um, but uh, keeping your eye on what the Lord is doing and keeping your eyes on Jesus, that's what we want to do. And being ready to go out as lifesavers and share the gospel with as many people. Bible prophecy, in my opinion, should stir us up. Not to go, wow, what amazing Bible prophecy, but to say, wow, we need to be busy about the work of the Lord. Remember when Daniel received his prophecies? Sometimes he didn't even understand what was going on. And, and then it said he went about the king's business. And I think that's what you and I should do. Like Daniel, the prophet of old, we need to go about the king's business, sharing the gospel, loving on people, uh, you know, make disciples, baptizing. This is what the church of Jesus Christ should be. Not a country club, but a life-saving station. Uh, let's pray and then I'll call it a night. Um, Lord, we are thankful uh, that we are called to such a high calling to preach the gospel, to share your word, to be lights in this dark world. I pray that when we need to be just loving and practical, helping people in practical things, uh, show us, Lord, how to better do that. Uh, teach us, Lord, how to make disciples better. Um, I pray that there'd be a boldness among the church and that many might come to know you in these last days. So we pray these things knowing you've heard our prayer now. We pray your blessing on the people that are watching here tonight. And I pray you'd cover all of them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me here in my little office uh, on this uh, Friday night. And we will see you all at one of the seven services. Uh, what is it? Saturday at 2, 4, and 6. 
or Sunday at 6, 8, 12, and wait, 6, 8, 10, and 12. That's it. They're all live. They're all, I mean, we're going to be doing them all. So I'm praying that my voice will hold out for those seven. Uh, it tends to do that pretty good. So uh, I'm, I'm trusting the Lord will get us through that. But also pray for our volunteers, our staff. That's just a ton of uh, work. We'll probably have close to 12,000 people come through our building this weekend for services. Uh, that's a, and that, that's a little bit of work for the crew. So pray for them. And man, Lord bless you guys. We'll see you next time.